Good afternoon, good evening. I see from the jet you're dialing in from all the different places around the world. Welcome to our third live event of healthcaretransformers.com. My name is Andrea Schneider and I've had the pleasure to be your host today. Today we're going to talk about data monetization in healthcare, how to safely share data in the stake of science. Um, what we will do today, we will hear multiple speakers uh, that will share their opinion and their view on how to address this very sensitive topic. HealthcareTransformers.com was established uh, um, from Rush as a platform to engage and inspire executives in healthcare in different and innovative approaches to solve ultimate problems that occur during the healthcare transformation that can be patient satisfaction or benefit for patients. It can be AI in healthcare, or it can be the sensitive topic of how to share data in the sake of science. We do that by inviting external speakers and experts who share their view and their approaches. And we do so even if that doesn't match 100% the rush view or the rush opinion. But we think by carefully listening, by engaging in an open, transparent discussion, we can help everybody to drive its own informed decision about a specific topic. So it's also true for this event. Before we kick the off, let me walk you through the agenda. So we will hear the introduction and the speech from two experts, and I will introduce them in a moment. And then we will have a discussion amongst us. And after that, we will start a Q&A where we also can answer your question you may have. At any point in time, you can ask the question just using the Q&A button on this app. And then you have also the option if you read another question to upvote the question. So we can focus on the most critical question for you as our audience. And with that, allow me to introduce the speakers of today. We're very happy to have with us Jim Stolze, a tech entrepreneur and a prominent figure in the European startup scene. And he's a thought leader and change maker in the field of exponential technologies. We also have with us Atul Booth. He's the chief data scientist for the entire University of California Health System and has authored more than 200 publications and researches, which are repeatedly features in the New York Times, Wall Street Journals, and Wired Magazine. And with that, I don't want to delay anything. I see uh, Atul already joined the stage. Uh, thank you for joining us, Atul. Uh, stage is yours. Great. Well, thanks for having me uh, today. So uh, as I was introduced, my name is Atul Butte. I'm a professor at UCSF in San Francisco, representing the work of 80 faculty members in my institute with new uh, efforts in research and development. But more relevant to this uh, audience is I'm the chief data scientist for the entire University of California Health System. We have 20 health professional schools, of which six are medical schools and 12 hospitals. And now we have a single central database with the records of 8 million patients treated over the past 10 years. And we're using this data in a respectful, regulated way to improve patient care quality. And that's what I'm going to spend the time talking about. How did we get to this database? How are we using it? And where are the savings, uh, you know, the so-called monetization of this type of data? I'm also the uh, founder of three investor-backed data-driven companies. And so I've seen the value of data, especially as it can help us create products and services for patients. But first, let me just introduce the University of California to you. We're enormous. We have 10 campuses and three national labs and six medical schools. And we don't just provide the regular care. We have some of the best care in America, especially if you're sick. We have 200,000 employees. 5,000 of which are doctors that get a paycheck every month from us and a quarter million students every year. And now we have this umbrella 
that we termed University of California Health or UC Health across the health enterprises of this enormous system. Uh, like I mentioned, we've treated about 8 million patients now in the past decade, and we make about $13 billion a year with clinical revenue. And we're working together in amazing ways, and data helps us work together in those ways. Our UC Health strategy is really about synergy, a recognition that we are stronger together than apart, and data helps us prove that. We're building towards a single accountable care organization, which in the United States means that we will aspirationally be able to contract as a single entity to small and large companies across the state and the nation. And we're using our data to improve our purchasing power. For example, we can put in a single purchase order for our products or services, drugs or devices, instead of scattered campuses putting in their own purchase orders. But of course, UC Health is about our data assets, incredible data assets. And really data assets in the health system now revolve around electronic health records. In the United States, we collectively have been spending billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars installing electronic health record systems. Now, of course, patients have been making measurements on patients for thousands of years and documenting what they've seen for hundreds of years. But with electronic health records, we are capturing nearly everything related to patient care in enormous databases, enormous expensive databases. I believe that these databases have clues, important clues that if we're smart enough, we can figure out what are we doing right in medicine, what are we missing, and what might be excessive and thus might be costing too much to deliver. Now, when you think about it, every drug made by every manufacturer and even the experimental ones, every medical device, all of these are recorded in the medical records, in the, health, in the electronic health record, especially when they're used on every patient. So eventually every pharmaceutical company, every medical device manufacturer is going to want to know how their products are doing in our patients as represented in the data. What is happening with every single one of our patients using every one of their products? Why might these uh, tools, drugs and devices work in one patient and fail in others? So all of that is possible with the data. So what do we have and what have we been doing? Every month we collect and harmonize and centralize all clinical data from all six of our academic health centers. So that's UC San Francisco, UC Los Angeles, Irvine, Davis, San Diego, and our newest medical school, Riverside. This happens every month that data is centralized, except for COVID data when it happens every night from six to nine in the morning, we get all the COVID test data. Now, it's important that it is hard to get bulk data sharing to happen uh, across, especially across the United States, but it's much easier when you have cooperating health systems that see a business reason to do this. And that's what we have. Now for the tech aficionados that are listening in, yes, we use Epic as our electronic health record system across the system, but multiple instances of Epic. Our central database is vendor neutral. We use an academic open medical standard for that. And we've had Epic now for 10 years. We have 10 years of longitudinal data on patients. Now to give you an example of why this is important data and what the scale of this, 300 million encounters, 810 million procedures on these patients, 1 billion medication orders or prescriptions written for these patients. You start to understand how expensive and how much money these procedures and medications cost and are charged for. And then you realize how valuable the data is around those drugs and devices and tools. Now in our system, we merge all of that with regulatory data, some text data, death index data, and we're constantly harmonizing these elements. That makes it valuable, but that also makes it hard as new drugs and devices are introduced constantly by the pharma and device industry. On specific campuses, we go even deeper. For example, at UCSF, we have all the imaging data, every single image uh, that has been obtained on a patient going back almost 20 years, as well as cancer genomics data, and all of this is de-identified for research use. Now the title for this session is data monetization, which is actually a term I do not like, okay? To me, I think the narrative is about improving healthcare and the healthcare system. We have sunk billions of dollars collecting this data. The narrative I tend to use is that it will be a national tragedy, if not international tragedy, if we don't use this data to improve the practice of medicine. Of course, we have to do this work safely, responsibly, respectfully. 
but what a tragedy it will be if we don't use this data to improve the practice of medicine. I often call this data the most expensive data in America now. We pay our doctors to type all of this stuff in. Now, of course, this might lead to the discovery of unneeded practices in medicine, which is going to lead to savings and might even lead to more revenue. Thus, I suppose, monetization. And the data itself can be used to ask and answer questions around the business and practice of medicine, which is also valuable. But it's not about selling the patient data. And that's a vulgar way to look at this. So I encourage you to think about the uses of the data, both within your organizations and externally, how to use that data safely and responsibly, and then where might that actually lead to savings and potentially even more revenue. But I'll give you specific examples of how we've done this. We've now developed central tools to improve the quality of the care that we deliver. Documenting the quality of care is increasingly important, especially for our government payers like Medicare and Medicaid. These require constant reporting. And because we have a central data warehouse now, we can cut the time needed to develop new reports and to develop those reports every quarter, uh, cutting in uh, by one fifth the amount of time needed uh, for those efforts. We've already decreased specific uh, unnecessary inpatient drug use. In the United States, many of our admissions are prearranged, the so pre negotiated payment under a diagnosis related group or a DRG. So any excessive care we deliver that's unnecessary is a waste of money on us. We, we lose money on those. One example that we've documented is IV acetaminophen, so intravenous acetaminophen. Most patients know that acetaminophen is a drug that in many countries you can obtain over the counter. The intravenous form is considerably more expensive than the tablets one might get at a chemist or pharmacist. Now, there may be appropriate uses for intravenous acetaminophen. For example, if one is trying to avoid opioids or perhaps a pediatric patient. And indeed, we use intravenous anything if the patient can't take anything by mouth. For example, pre-operation or post-op. But we notice many doses of IV acetaminophen being given surrounded by other oral drugs. So really calls into question, why can't the acetaminophen be given by an oral drug like a tablet? And indeed, we can start to make a list of all the doctors and protocols and all the care that's somehow requiring IV acetaminophen and start to fix that. And indeed, our use of IV acetaminophen has plummeted across the University of California health system, saving us millions of dollars, okay? We were being paid the same amount now we don't need to use this expensive drug anymore. That's an example, I suppose, of monetization of the data. We have other, many such uh, examples. Population health management, where we make sure we're trying to avoid side effects for our patients, especially around type 2 diabetes, where we have a single dashboard now across our major medical centers that show the nearly 50,000 patients we're actively managing. And to make sure that their eye, kidney, foot, and overall health is optimized, and there were the ones that need to be are on cardioprotective agents because we don't want to have uh, side effects and uh, uh, untoward complications later in life for them. And those are that's cost savings for us as well. Now to be a little bit more direct, clinical research where we're recruiting, recruiting for trials and these trials benefit patients, but of course we might make some sponsored research dollars there as well. In cancer, for example, we have 100,000 active cancer, cancer patients across our five National Cancer Institute designated cancer centers. We are starting to now finally try to recruit all of those patients from all of our campuses in trials of the future, uh, specifically around precision medicine and cancer genomics. Now, of course, another big use of data is to train artificial intelligence. I've heard it said that data is the new oil. Indeed, if you look at major magazines, you might see oil uh, data equated to oil barrels or oil refineries. And I've also heard it said that if data is the new oil, AI is the new engine. I'm sure we're going to hear more about this from Jim. But I prefer to think of data as the new soil, not the new oil. Because with oil, either I get that barrel of oil or you do. For, data, for soil, we might both plant our seeds and watch them grow together. So we don't have to grab one gets the data and the other doesn't. Data is not like that. So, of course, we need to use data to train artificial intelligence. At UCSF, we've made enormous progress with that. One public deal that was mentioned uh, uh, several years ago is a major partnership with GE uh, in the development of medical devices. Specifically now, 
the new uh, portable chest X-ray units uh, that might be used, for example, in intensive care units are now trained with X-rays uh, acquired from the University of California, San Francisco. So that now the X-ray technician uh, will get an instant reading as to whether the breathing tube, the endotracheal tube is in the right place or uh, whether there's a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. Those films, those images, those digital images don't need to be, don't need to wait for a radiologist. The AI in the device now uh, will actually help make that type of reading. So this is a co-development arrangement between UCSF and GE, where they're both partnering in terms of uh, computational expertise, but also around that data to help train AI. Safe, respectful use of the data to train AI, both ourselves and with partners, are coming for us and other health systems. I'd see this as a big future direction. The governance around that, we can leave to Jim to discuss in a moment. But indeed, we have hundreds of companies now with, uh, with FDA cleared algorithms in biomedicine, hundreds of companies that have been cleared by the FDA. 150 just in radiology, up from just a handful five years ago. The American College of Radiology curates that list. In fact, I just saw four were approved last month. So this is a skyrocketing trend the development of AI, especially around radiology. And this is because of increasingly clear guidance from the FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration, on considering AI and machine learning as software as a medical device. In fact, we at UCSF have partnered with the FDA itself, looking at uh, COVID-related products, vaccines and therapeutics, but even beyond like CAR T cells and other expensive, hard to use therapeutics. Uh, they, like us, want to know whether these are working in our patients. The FDA calls this new field real world evidence, again, made more clear by separate FDA guidance. We used to just call it clinical data. Now we're calling this real world data, real world evidence. Amazingly, drugs themselves can be approved solely using clinical data. The best example of this uh, was the partnership between Pfizer and Flatiron, uh, a private company, to gain approval of uh, polycyclid, which is known as Ibrance, for breast cancer especially male breast cancer. There was enough clinical data on males being treated off-label with this molecule that just with clinical data, the, the company was able to get approval for this drug. Now, Flatiron is a great example of a company that actually works on the electronic health record side, but also uses that data, working with community oncology practices um, to, get, uh, to get those EHR installed, but to also use that data to help get drugs approved for patients. And of course, they were acquired by Roche for $2 billion back in 2018. The company was only five years old. And of course, real world evidence, real world data, if the FDA is interested in it, pharma and biotechs are interested as well through sponsored research. We don't have to even give them the data as a university. We work on a question and answer together, but we're making sure that this is done safely responsibly, respectfully. And there are many companies in this area now. Enference, Verona Health, Trinetics, Verily. I'm not endorsing any of them. And that's just a small list of an enormous growing list of companies in this area. Now I've spent all this time talking about clinical data, but there are other types of data as well, each with their own value. Claims data, surely the oldest type of medical data, codes for billing, procedures, laboratory tests. This is great data, it's voluminous because we're constantly sending bills to each other, certainly in the US healthcare system. There are a lot of private and public efforts here. Truven Health was a, is a well-known company. Uh, IBM uh, had acquired them and now it's being spun out. Uh, uh, Shore scripts and many others on the prescription side. Imaging data, I started to mention, is uh, archived often in health systems. Now this is a lot harder data to move because these files are enormous, but those can be compared with uh, clinical studies, uh, I think uh, I certainly am mentioning our partnership with GE. So there's value in training machine learning with that. Genotyping and genetics data, uh, blood samples from aware and consented patients can be used to collect genetics data. And then when coupled with electronic health record data could be useful for drug discovery. Uh, good examples are the well-known partnership between Regeneron and Geisinger Health in the United States. Uh, and uh, there are many others, uh, genetics first types of approaches but using the electronic health record data to understand those patients uh, so that maybe molecules and genetic targets uh, can be discovered. Cancer genetics data is a specific type of genetics data 
And we see many partners in that area. So I mentioned Flatiron, but ASCO, M2Gen, many other collectors of this type of data out there. And then clinical research and clinical trials data, including increasingly patient-related and patient-reported data. Uh, but this is often squirreled away in uh, repositories for analytics. It's traditionally never released to uh, vendors or to the public or data aggregators, but there's increasingly pressure to have this data uh, reach the public. Now, because of uh, funding ma mandates from NIH and Wellcome Trust and Gates Foundation, I believe we're going to see more academic clinical research data reach the public and probably even reach companies as well. And then finally, patient-generated data, probably the newest type of this data. That patient-generated data could be conscious or unconscious, right? This could be surveys, for example, and patient uh, questions, but it could also be uh, assert, uh, ascertained behaviors, wearables, location tracking, newer phone-based tools uh, to gain consent and then capture this type of data, like Apple's research kit and many others now. And soon patients will be entering their data directly themselves into medical records. Initially through their medical devices like home lung spirometry kits for as a patient with asthma or blood glucose measurements, right? For patients with diabetes and blood pressure measurements. But I think this is gonna to expand to cover a patient's mood or types of food they enjoy or the exercise they do as well. Now I'm gonna uh, really think about where, where's the new opportunity or what's the green field to explore. I think, I think there's a huge future in empowering patients with their own data. And I think that's the future that we haven't really tapped into yet. In the United States, most of our medical systems now export patients' medical record data to the patients themselves. We do this through federal standards. Uh, for example, the FHIR format that the federal government makes us use. Now, it used to be an option, but it's slowly becoming federal law that we have to export patients' data to them through patient portals and now through these federal types of standards. One example of this is uh, if you happen to uh, uh, get your care in the United States, you might be familiar with an iPhone. And one way to see the medical record data is to go into the Apple Health app and to tap on health records or health data and health records. And if you just type in major medical uh, systems, uh, their names, you could see the logos and that they're ready to export data to your smartphone. Now, this is great. This is right. And it's probably federal law now that we have to do this. But this is also a green field to empower patients with their own data. And I don't mean a patient just looking at their numbers and their text documents, because this is going to include the clinical notes as well. I see a future of patients trying to understand what should they do next, given their medical record data. I've seen some of my own medical record data on my smartphone. I happen to be a physician, so I can understand it. But right now, we're exporting a lot of raw data to patients because we're told to do this. Where is that layer of apps uh, to help patients with decision support? I see that as the future. Uh, of course, it has to be done in a safe, responsible way. But maybe that's the next level of data monetization, the 99 cent app of the future, perhaps, to help a patient understand their blood test results, or perhaps the cardiac echocardiography report that's also showing up in their records. Now, I've been told many times I make everything seem easy, okay? And you're right, I am guilty of that. A lot of this is still not solved. How are we going to actually use clinical data to generate or update our evidence, right? On which therapeutic options are working? Of course, that's gonna mean more use of certain drugs and less use of other drugs, right? And so money will be changing, at least the monetization and remuneration for companies are gonna be changing based on evidence generated from this data. How are we gonna better understand what exactly is happening with patients? How do we get more data on our patients without further burdening them, uh, or without further burdening our doctors or nurses? Uh, I think it's gonna be impossible to ask them to spend even one more minute than needed on an electronic health record system right now? And can the public trust us with these measurements and data and data sources? How do we responsibly share this data with the necessary groups amongst ourselves and with industries to get their help? I've said it before many times that data to me, data is frozen knowledge. We have to bring light and heat and energy to melt it, to release the knowledge, right? Data by itself is frozen. We're trying to get to the knowledge inside. And that's gonna take a lot of energy and heat and light. 
but we have to do this safely, responsibly, respectfully, which means having the self-discipline and governance to make sure the right things happen for health systems and patients. And that is what I'm proud of being able to do at the University of California, to put our health record system data together, not just so that we can save money by doing less, but so we can actually start to deliver more, more clinical trials, more clinical options at the right time in the right way for our patients. But how are we gonna do this all right? How are we gonna tolerate health systems and working with industries when every state in the United States and every country in the world has their own different ways to look at data and privacy and laws and regulation and governance? With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to take over the second half. Oh, wow. Right. Wow. Thank you, Atu. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> no, great job. Um, thank you so much for also introducing me in this way. And Andreas, thank you so much for inviting me. And hello, Healthcare Transformers. It's nice to be connected with all of you. I saw in the chat all these different parts of the world connecting. I'm saying hi to you from Amsterdam, where it's really stormy uh, right now. It's, it's bad weather. So it's nice weather to be in a webinar like, like this, yeah. So again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, a little disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't work for Rush. I am a big nerd. Yes, and I'm proud of it. Actually, my oldest son, his name is Max. He's 18 years old. He calls me an entrepreneur, which means that I'm an entrepreneur and I like technology. So I built companies with technologies that are emerging, that are not yet mainstream, and with business models that don't work yet. <laughs> so that is really exciting. That gets my juices uh, going. One of my companies is called Agency, and that's written with AI, so Artificial Intelligence Agency. And the kind folks at Roche asked me to share my perspective on the theme of how to safely share your data for the sake of science just from the more the business, perhaps the corporate uh, perspective. And another disclaimer, I won't be using slides, so you'll just have to deal with me and my beard. Right, and I look forward, of course, to the interactive part of this webinar. Uh, later on, I'm gonna butt heads with Atul, and all your questions are welcomed as well. Andreas will moderate uh, between us who gets to answer which question. So don't be shy, don't be polite, ask your questions uh, with the Q&A function. Right, um, so let's talk about sharing data or let's talk about safely sharing data for the sake of science. And if you think a bit longer about these two words, safely share, then you'll realize that that is actually something that you can discuss on three levels. And I guess the basic level of safely sharing means that it's secure, right? You want, you want your data to be safe. So I'm not saying that security um, is taken for granted. It's not, you should always be worried. You should always be paranoid about security, but just for the sake of discussion, let's just agree that the way we store our data is safe, right? So that could be a whole different webinar, but for now, let's say security is paramount. Let's go to level number two. And then you can say, well, to safely share my data, that also means privacy in a privacy friendly way. I think Atul also uh, called it respectfully or respective, respectfully, yeah. So it needs to be secure, it needs to be safe, but also my privacy, my personal freedom has to be secured. So that's level two. I will say some words about that. And then in the end, uh, the third level is safely shared will um, have implications for ethics. So in an ethical way, is it safely shared? So let's talk about privacy first. And uh, to do that, I'm going to take you to uh, the real world. Let's say, because uh, right now in Europe, we're opening up a little bit, right? You can go to the pub, you can go to the cafeteria again. Let's say that you want to order a, uh, a beer uh, or an, uh, another refreshment, uh, alcohol. And then usually we notice from the movies, the bartender 
asks for some sort of ID, ID, right? So then you uh, you pick up your, your driver license and uh, you show it, and then uh, he or she looks at it, and then, well, basically looking at the birth date and the photo, yes, you get your beer or your whiskey or what have you, or no, you're under 18, you're not allowed to drink, right? That is in the physical way, that's the way we've always done it. If you move this to the digital world, to the world that we are talking about right now during this webinar, uh, the same would apply. But it isn't just that the bartender will look at your age and your photo, and he might try to remember the rest, but physically that's impossible. He won't remember of all his uh, people who, who ordered alcohol. But in the digital world, usually uh, tech companies or other service providers will actually scan your ID and have all this data within their company, right? So they're storing all this data that they don't really need. All they needed was to know whether or not you are old enough to drink alcohol and you are who you say you are. But in the meantime, they're tricking you to send in all these unnecessary data. Now, this is, of course, um, dangerous because it's sensitive data. Uh, your, your place of birth is in there, your nationality, perhaps your height, all this sensitive personal data is now within their company. And if they get hacked or they get a ransomware attack, then you are screwed, right? So this needs to change. Now, as I said, I, I, I love emerging technologies and this is where a lot of people say, well, perhaps blockchain can be a solution. And um, you can accuse me of a lot of things. <laughs> you can call me a techno-optimist, but I truly believe that the principles behind blockchain technology can actually bring something to the table here. Uh, to refresh your memory, blockchain is a decentralized technology, which means that the data is not stored in one central place. So it's scattered across the network. It's distributed. And even better, uh, the attributes are, um, uh, you are in charge of giving access to certain attributes to certain parties. And you can also revoke that access. So let's think about the beer that you drank. Let's say it's Heineken. If you want to order something online from the Heineken web shop, then uh, perhaps you could, instead of showing them your ID, they could use your personal data vault on the blockchain where your data is shared, stored, excuse me, where your data is stored. And you might give access to this website, in this case, Heineken, only to look at this piece of your data vault that says that you are 18 years or older. You're not giving away your birth date or birthplace or national, no, just one or zero. 18 plus or 18 minus. So the Heineken website will make a call with an API requesting this data and immediately it gets back, Jim is 18 plus, so yes, he can buy alcohol. This is a very simple, essential way or fundamental application of a blockchain technology where you as a customer or in the light of this discussion, of course, you as a patient, you are the owner of your data. That was also an important thing, uh, a point that Atul made. He said, I think in the future that empowering patients with their data, well, that is spot on. In this case, the blockchain could be your help. It could be just a technology. It's invisible. You don't need to know all about it. You just use it just like an app on your phone as a data vault with your personal data and you give access. And the moment you don't trust Heineken anymore, you can revoke that access and they can never check whether or not you're 18 or older, right? Uh, I know that uh, this is a, a theoretical application. Right now on the European level, they are working on a similar application. So using blockchain technology with these data vaults for the purpose of education, basically university degrees. So in the near future, and I think they have past the, uh, the prototype phase in the near future, it is uh, for you impossible to Photoshop 
your diploma from um, Harvard or, or, or another prestigious medical school and Photoshop your name and upload it when you're uh, uh, trying to get a job. In the future, the, the, the organization that wants to hire you reads on your resume, on your CV, uh, a certain code, a hash, for example, and they will check this hash with the API that is on the blockchain of all these university uh, diplomas, this big database where all the universities are sharing information, not data, they're sharing information so that the person that wants to hire you can do the call. Did Jim Stoltz indeed go to this university and did he obtain his degree? Yes or no, zero or one. No other personal data is shared during that callback with the API. So I know blockchain is a buzzword, but I hope that this short story changed your perspective. You think, huh, well, there's actually something in this uh, story. And I see some comments about Web 3.0 and the metaverse, and I'm sure that we'll be talking about that later on during the uh, Q&A. But as I promised, it was a story of three levels. Security is the foundation, the fundament we, that needs to be in order. Uh, I've spoken a little bit now about privacy, more or less about privacy preserving technologies, PPTs. If you have some money left, you want to invest in companies and startups, I would suggest this is uh, not advice, this is information that you would invest in privacy preserving technologies because that is a growth market. And then I promised to talk about sharing data uh, ethically, ethically. And this is, um, this is the world of semantics because usually these discussions, people say, yeah, we are so data rich. We have big data, we have bigger data. It's the new oil or the new soil or what have you. And then we will apply AI and then everything uh, will change, but we have to do it in an ethical way. And then everybody says, yeah, but nobody actually talks about what that means or how you organize that or how do you govern it. So I'm going to tell you a little story, an anecdote of um, a piece of software, AI software uh, that my company built. So it's firsthand. It's not something that someone read in a Harvest Business Review. It's straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. Uh, this was a... Um, an assignment by the Dutch Ministry of Health. So uh, it, it it goes too far to to completely explain the the, the concept or the um, the data that we had, but it was a big database. Of course, it was de-identified or uh, anonymized. If you want, there was no personal data like name, uh, ethnicity, nationality, uh, age, gender. No, only the columns in the database that we would that would be useful to train our model. No, when I say model, uh, that is basically the algorithm, a piece of software that we were designing, that we were developing to sift through all their historic data. And as I said, it was a lot of data. This was not something that one person could do in Microsoft Excel. No, it was it was a lot of oil, a lot of soil. Um, and our algorithm would try to find patterns that would predict whether or not someone would be one or zero, right? Uh, simple classifications. And it was supervised learning. So already a lot of these dossiers, these digital files, had been looked at by real humans, civil servants from the Ministry of Health, who looked at uh, such a dossier and they would say, okay, or not okay, right? One or zero. And our algorithm would sift through the data, find patterns that would predict whether or not a certain dossier would have a one or a zero. How do you do that? Well, basically you train your model, you train your algorithm on let's say 25% of the data. And then if you think your model uh, works, you try it, you test it with data that the model hasn't seen before. So it hasn't been trained with that part of the data, uh, but you know the outcome, but you don't share that with the model. And then the model tries on this new data, say, I think this is a one, this is a one, this is a zero, this is a zero. And then you compare that with the actual scores. And then you know 
the accuracy of your model, if you're doing well or not. Well, I know that while I'm saying this, a lot of you are thinking, wow, that's just, um, what could be an ethical component? Well, of course, explainability, other people say transparency, uh, is a big issue here. Because certainly in a healthcare situation, or if a, if a government uses algorithms or data, you don't want it to be a black box. So one of the first decisions that we made was to use an algorithm to create a computer model that was okay when it comes to accuracy, but scored really well on our explainability. And I know that there are some people who say, well, this is a trade-off, you know, uh, the more accurate a certain model is, uh, the less explainable it is. I don't think so. I don't think so. But for, for the sake of this, uh, this particular assignment, we chose a decision tree. Decision tree, many of you will know this, decision tree is a algorithm or a set of algorithms when you use a random forest. And that works really well with supervised learning. Why is this supervised? Well, because we had already all these dossiers that were labeled by these professionals. So the moment our model would use a classification, would give a classification, a one or a zero of new data, and someone from the Ministry of Health said, wait a minute, how did the algorithm come to this conclusion? Then we could say, well, it's easy. We would open up the hood, <laughs> and then they could look at the model and say, well, because 28% from this and 49% from that, and then the civil servant would say, huh, that makes sense. So it was explainable it was understandable and also i think that is even more <laughs> important it was reproducible so also with other data that the model had never seen the same predictable outcomes would come to pass so that is a good thing um, also what was interesting was that because this because the ministry of health had so much data it, it wasn't doable for the civil servants on a day-to-day -day basis from nine to five to to handle all this data. Uh, and usually when they would have to pick five dossiers, check uh, nine dossiers, sorry, uh, to have one that they wouldn't have had to miss. They would, that was, I, I can't say fraudulent, but something that, that couldn't be uh, okay, right? When our software did this, when we had nine, five of them, they wouldn't have missed. So it increased productivity. And that uh, prompted the question from the chief privacy officer of the uh, Ministry of Health. He said, how do you know that perhaps not um, the, uh, the model isn't biased against, let's say, women, that more women are present in this pool that you are uh, selecting than men, because we can not discriminate against or on gender. And then our answer was, we don't know because we were not allowed to use the column of gender. That's an awkward conversation. So we went back to the drawing board. We asked permission to also include the column of gender in our model. So we had to uh, come up with new, new agreements. And then we ran the model again. And then we could, could compare our model with and our model without the column of gender and say see if there was overlap yes or no or perhaps that uh, in some cases there were more men or more women present um, this is difficult stuff to talk about but the moment um, on my team i had some not just ai developers but also uh, stat hats uh, people who were really good at statistics they can give you the visual representation of those two and then immediately everyone could see okay so we are not biased against a certain gender, yes or no. But that doesn't mean that the model was perfect because it turns out you could check for a certain column, but there are also proxies in the data. Let's say that the model would discover that some people had a gap in the resume of say like nine months. Um, this is often the case with women if they get a baby you know they're out of the work uh the workforce for a few months 
So even if your algorithm doesn't select on a gender, also these proxies could be the case that your algorithm is biased. And this is not just for gender, this is also the case, for, of course, for nationality and age, etc. So with everything we did from the start, we said we want to be ethical by design. Now, this is something that you hear about uh, a lot. But this is what that means. This is what that meant. We also used the acronym FACT, FACT, F-A-C-T, that stands for fairness, accuracy, confidentiality, and transparency. So the F from fairness, that means is the model not biased against certain groups? Accuracy, this means um, you could find a correlation, but are you sure that this is also causation, right? And a machine, a computer, won't help you with that. The machine, the computer is brilliant in sifting through data, finding patterns, finding patterns. But the causation is something that you, a human being, a medical doctor or someone who works at the Ministry of Health should look at and then apply the label. Don't let the machine apply the labels themselves or just assume stuff because computers are very bad at assuming. And uh, see, uh, confidentiality, of course, that is uh, what I said about the, uh, in Europe, we have GDPR rules. Uh, we, we cannot use all data, uh, the points that we have. And the T stands for transparency. And that is the explainability of the model, right? And the reproducibility of the model. Now, then you might think then, okay, so these are all the ethical uh, elements or attributes of the model, but there is actually more. And this is why Atul uh, hinted already at the fact that I was going to talk about uh, governance, because uh, I think that is the new horizon. Because when it comes to data and AI, the foundation has been laid. We, we already know the importance of data. Nobody needs to be convinced of that. We are playing around with AI. Uh, we are trying to come up with predictive models, etc. So the next frontier, and, and it, this is going great, by the way, ex, especially when it comes to medical imaging, right? Deep learning, image recognition, uh, even the radiologists are saying, yeah, we like this very much. Uh, why? Because it's supervised learning and it, it, it helps them become uh, more efficient, better healthcare professionals. But the new horizon is doing this in a responsible way. And this also asks new skills from the board or from the, uh, the hospital uh, directors or uh, the, the, the people in charge. Because usually when a supervisory board member would talk to the, the management, uh, these were conversations that we can all follow. But when it comes to AI, it's very hard to talk about these things. So what, what, what I like to do with supervisory boards and also other people who are in charge, I give them a new toolkit with questions. And question number one, for example, for someone who is in, on a supervisory board, is when you speak with your, uh, your director or the CTO, uh, question number one is, are we using data and algorithms within our organization? And do you have a list? And then usually the answer is, uh, um, yeah. And then you'll say, okay, don't worry, uh, no problem. I'll ask you again next week. So next week, you ask, so are we using data and algorithm in outcome? Do you have a list? And they say, yes, boss, we have a list. Here it is. And then question number two will be, huh, that's interesting. So on what data was this algorithm trained? And then the answer will be, uh, uh, I don't know. And you say, no problem. I'll ask again next week. Well, you can see where this is going. All these questions have to be asked. How did we get this data? Um, what data uh, was used? What data was not used? That is just as important as the question, what data was used? What data wasn't used? Uh, what labels were given? Supervised learning. Who gave those labels? What labels were not given? Um, was it uh, synthesized data? Um, did we outsource the labeling? For example, I've done projects with uh, AWS uh, Mechanical Turk. This means that outside of your organization, people are labeling the data. That's, 
that says something about the quality of the data. That's something that you as a supervisor should definitely know. So these are all these new questions that are just as important as the technological questions. So you can ask, are we using TensorFlow or PyTorch, right? That's a very basic question. But these questions that, that now that I'm giving to you are equally as, uh, as important. And I think that is uh, forgotten a lot of times. So um, Andreas, thank you for giving me the time to uh, highlight uh, this during this uh, webinar. And I think now when I look at the clock, it's, uh, it's time to, uh, to get interactive, Atu. What do you think? <laughs> I think so. I think so. You are awesome. Uh, uh, I think um, so. Uh, I can go first. Uh, so great talk, uh, as expected. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew you'd get to governance there too. But uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I mean, so there's a lot going on in the world right now with data, and I think uh, seeing just the chat and the Q and A, uh, a lot of concern about it as well. Right. Um, but first question I, I would have for you. I mean, so we have many, many groups and companies promoting uh, AI tools across the healthcare ecosystem. Um, and let's, you know, let's think about just healthcare for a moment from drug discovery to quality improvement. How would you think, how would a health system leader know which of these solutions are real and which are just hype? Hmm. Uh, Touche. I, I think there's a lot of hype <laughs> in the market. Um, actually, a lot of startups that already existed are now adding AI to their names or adding machine learning to the pitch to get funded. And it works. Um, but seriously, I think um, to answer your question, if I were on the other side of the table, I would really like to know whether or not this company uses open source software. Open source software and, and uh, different than free software. I'm talking about open source software because that says something about the company and in a positive way, because if it's proprietary software, there are good reasons perhaps to do that, but that also says something about the software. I really like the companies that use open source software because in the end, as you said, data is a new soil you want to co-create. So you or someone for your team would also like to go on GitHub and contribute to their code. And usually that is way easier when it's open source software. And the other aspect that I would uh, look at is, um, it, are the results... Um, reproducible because usually people say well it's so accurate right we have 95 percent accuracy yeah sure but that was with your data how about now trying the model with my data there are actually some companies here in europe that are selling medical ai tools and hospitals are buying them without even testing them with their photos right so that these are the two uh, aspects that i would uh, that i would judge when i was speaking with an uh, ai tool supplier yeah, I think you're right. I mean, testing these models uh, and uh, incoming uh, uh, algorithms uh, with one's own data is, is certainly going to be critical, especially during a pilot phase uh, mm. or something like that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think even the first year of such use of these algorithms needs to be carefully monitored. Uh, there could be uh, artifacts and how uh, up in you know upstream data sources and things are changing, oh, yeah. and people might not know. Uh, for sure. I mean, so another, let me lead to a different question, a slightly different question then. All of this is going to be hard for health systems, okay? Um, what do you think is going to be the minimum AI talent a health system is going to need just to have in-house? Uh, hmm. Will some, many, maybe all hospitals soon be hiring chief AI officers? <laughs> Woo. I like the question. Uh, well, Let's first say that I don't think that every healthcare professional needs to become a data scientist. I mean, you are like a rock, a rock star with all the, <laughs> all the knowledge that you bring to the table. But I think the, the ordinary healthcare uh, service provider doesn't need to be educated as a data scientist. But I do think that everyone who works in healthcare needs to know the mindset of a data scientist. Yeah. Right? knows how to think, as my friends in America say, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. <laughs> right? it, it helps if you can use data to back your ideas, actually, to convince your team that this is the right route or to convince, man convince management that you should get more funding. Uh, 
Can, can I ask a question in a return? Because of course. I was I was blown away by the, the the numbers that you used about the the enormous uh, volumes of data uh, that that you were using. Would you say that you have enough data to actually <laughs> use it in a relevant and useful way? You know, data people always say they never have enough data, right? That's why. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, but the the beauty of the the data ecosystem is that whether you believe you have enough or not, it will continue to grow, right? So it's mm. growing exponentially at some rate, you can argue. Yep. Um, and certainly our data centers will keep growing and be filled with data. Uh, and not not just more, but of different kinds, right? We, we certainly can see that. I mentioned the whole list. So I don't think we ever have enough. But at the same time, the corollary then is that one is never done collecting data. And so to me, what that means is don't wait for perfection here. Mm. And don't wait for the perfect, right? The game now is what is your current set of data good enough for today, right? Of course, you're going to have more. Of course, it's going to get better. It's going to get better curated, better accuracy. But what is it good enough for now? Right. That's the real question, I think. All right. I, I see that in the way you, you've been doing things as well. Yeah, what indeed, uh, how much data do you need? Just a little bit more, but <laughs> what, what are you going to do in the meantime? So that, uh, is there a certain kind of data that you would think that you would need to have more of? Yeah, I think so. I think longitudinal, especially in the medical side, longitudinal data is mm. particularly important. Um, you know, short-term uh, types of care are great, but if we can see how patients are doing five or 10 20 years out from a procedure or a particular diagnosis. I think longitudinal data is particularly useful and more valuable in, in many ways. Uh, I can start to see imaging data. So we have a lot of folks working on radiology. Pathology imaging data is gonna be much harder to get to for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that's useful. But um, I, I can see other data sources, uh, to getting to patients between their encounters, getting to voice data, trying to transcribe what doctors would do with patients. Mm. So there's data around the e entire ecosystem. Financial data is particularly important to see how much things are costing, how much are things getting charged for. So um, more of all of those, uh, yes, we'll take let it. Me, let me yeah. step in here because you're always talking about is there enough data and having data, what type of data. I, I'm, I'm going, coming now from a little bit from a tech perspective. There is a lot of computer power, a lot of data transfer bandwidth you need to have, right? I mean, not every hospital or health system can afford to build all that infrastructure and power. Does that mean the tech companies take over uh, the control over this whole thing? Because you're, you know, at the end, they operate all that and they gain the IP and the knowledge. How do, how do you think about that? Well, so separate the IP and knowledge for a second here, right? So, of course, we'll use vendors to do computer-related things for us, right? Well, it could be as simple as the networking, but it could, for example, radiology, right? The enormous files, of, at large files that the, uh, a particular CAT scan or MRI might generate might be stored on a hard drive, which is purchased from a vendor, uh, might be networked, and we might be leasing the network to that data center. The data center we might not run either. So of course, we're going to use vendors and we make sure that they follow our privacy practices. There are all sorts of terms uh, and federal rules on how we can get to business associates like that. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they own the intellectual property, right? So the, the raw kind of hardware networking level, I think is at one level. Figuring out the creative uses for this data uh, are a different level of company, I think sometimes. You know, there's startups involved, but they're also large companies, Amazon, Google, um, IBM, uh, Apple are all working in this space right now, plus many other large multinationals. Um, yeah, and you're right. When you're working at that higher level, you might have to share intellectual property or co do co-development. Um, but at the so, same time, if we don't get the talent unless we work with them. So, so here's the next follow-up. I mean, you talked already about companies that, I mean, uh, I'm as a European, uh, Jim, I, I, I asked this question straight to you. Mm. Now, I mean, there is this, tech war, uh, from an European perspective, we observe this tech war between the US and China and so on. And all the big names of the big tech companies coming from these countries, more or less. Does Europe fall behind on that? Or how do you look at that landscape? Ooh, well, do you have an hour? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. There are a lot of good questions uh, yeah. coming from the audience. And we're going to move to that in a moment. But I, I really right. want to see your opinion as you uh, have okay. this tech expertise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
I agree with Atul that we, we need uh, data centers or we need uh, third parties sometimes to do the number crunching for us. I mean, if you have these big, gigantic data sets and you have your models, you want them to be trained, sure, you could do it on, on, on a GPU-based computer that, that you have, but it's much easier to buy it in the cloud with AWS or Amazon or Google or, or, or what have you. And if I would do that, then of course I would check the box that I would like to have it done in Frankfurt or in, in Switzerland, in a place where I know that my privacy is protected uh, by GDPR and the European firewall. That is a, a choice that I would make because you're right, uh, innovation goes faster in the United States and also in, in, in China and other, other parts of the world because Europe is giving us a hard time, but I think for a good reason. And I think in time, you'll see that other parts of the world are, will also be catching up and saying, yeah, we want to innovate with data, but in a privacy preserving way or in a way that is ethically and just. Okay, thanks. Thanks both for, for that. Uh, maybe we switch gears and really got, uh, go into the question that's coming sure. from the audience. There are a lot, and uh, I think I fear we're not going to cover all, but uh, we will figure out what we do with the remaining ones. The most voted question is a very, very interesting one. Uh, is Who is the owner of all these data, and is there any informed consent? Uh, maybe we start with Atul, as you have this uh, hospital, and then maybe Jim, you step in uh, sure. from your perspective. Okay, so first, uh, I'm going to answer this in a kind of odd way. I never use the word O, oh, the owner word, because ownership is very dependent on each region. And in fact, in the United States, um, it's very different state to state who owns the data. So what I instead will say is that we have a copy and the patient should have a copy. Okay, ownership is a legal term. I'm not going to use that here. So we should have a copy. We treat these patients and they should have a copy. Now we give a copy to the patients and we've got to give more and more to them. And that's federal law. So we're going to all have to comply with that. We keep a copy. And it's very regulated what we're allowed to do with that copy, right? So we can improve the quality of our care. We can look to, for problems in our care, right? And then we can also do research. But to do research, it's very strict how we are allowed to do research. If we de-identify that, and that's coded in federal law in HIPAA, now more than 20 years old, we can go one route. If we actually need some identifiers, like where does the patient live, um, what dates they actually received care, then we have to go a different route. And we might have to get review from an institutional review board, an IRB, and the IRB has patient uh, representatives as well. So it's a complicated answer because you can't ask a simple question, who owns the data? It depends. I can cross one state line and that law changes in the United States. So instead we have a copy, it's strictly regulated what we can do with that copy, uh, the patient should have a copy too. Yeah, that, and I, I, I respect that answer and I know you are, uh, you are knee deep in, in the mud, you are actually giving a pragmatic answer. If you ask me to, uh, to be devil's advocate, I get a bit uh, anxious when I hear the word copy because <laughs> uh, the more copies there are, uh, the more risk, uh, the more we are at risk. So if it's at all possible to say that in the future, the patient owns, sorry to use the O word, but the patient owns the data and he or she gives permission not to share the data, but to give access to all these examples that I gave. So the APIs then I think that is the only way that we have privacy preserving technology. And it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, blockchain technology. I know that in Estonia, they already built this like this, no copies. There's just one system that deals with all the information and it's damn secure, right? So these are two, my two cents. Yeah, maybe also, the, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, just a quick response. There are a lot of things, for example, that we need to keep track of that we don't put into that central record. Like for example, mm. what is the bill we sent? How much did it cost us to deliver this care, right? These are things that are internal to our business. Right. So remember, Estonia is one thing, but the United States has a competitive healthcare system where the systems do compete for business. Um, so that's why it's also harder to imagine a single solution for the United States happening, uh, especially a single blockchain, for example, where uh, we, health systems, 
often don't share data with each other. This gets to one of the other questions in the Q&A. Mm. Health systems don't often share bulk data share with each other because they don't want to, because they yeah. compete with each other for patients, billions of dollars of revenue. Um, and so um, it's a competitive healthcare system. It's not my fault it is in the United States. <laughs> no. I'm not sure why we yeah. like it, but that is what it is. Yeah, in this context, I think the second highest voted question goes a little bit in this question. Uh, and, and I, it's a long question. I hope I, I condense it in the right way. Uh, the question whether this is a fair approach to say that we should rather gather and share all medical records, all the diagnostic test result in a decentralized way so that the patient directly benefit from their data and contribution and keeping their data privacy and ownership. It also gives them a little bit negotiation power or the willingness to cooperate with uh, researchers, with patients. Uh, in a, I think your, your Heineken example, Jim, goes a little bit in that direction, but I wanna hear your direct answer whether this is the way to go or what yeah. do you think? Yeah, well, and, uh, I actually think that this um, this sounds a bit like uh, open health or a patient sphere, where a, a certain technology is actually used for patients to opt in. So they give permission to share their data, personal data, and in return, uh, pharmaceutical organizations or healthcare organizations who use the data actually also pay the patient in return. So it's not just getting insights from it, but also monetizing uh, the data. So I'm not saying that this is the business model for the future. I'm just saying that if patients are interested in this and they opt in actively, we have a beautiful model. Yeah, I'm going to answer it by saying it's not even the future at all. It is happening now. So remember, we as health systems want to give data to patients. What they do with it is their business. Mm. And that's outside of HIPAA and that's, that's up to them, right? Patients have a right to do what they want with their record data. There are companies coming in, anything from uh, nonprofit groups for specific diseases, all the way to for-profit companies. Luna DNA is one example that actually used the blockchain. So you can contribute and eventually you can monetize a payment. Uh, we as health systems aren't gonna block that type of approach. So patients can do what they want with their data. Um, yeah, think, I would never interpret the question in a way also, do you even have the right to use the data without the permission of the patient? Because at the moment, it's, we, we, yeah, I, right. I know Jim doesn't like the word of copy, but obviously you have the central system, you store and use the data in the hospital system, and then you give access to the patient on top of that. The question right. is whether this is even correct or the patient owns the data and needs, you need to have a permission to even use it in-house. Yeah, so in the United States, we saw this two ways. So HIPAA, uh, right now, almost 25 years old, gives us the right to do specific things with that data, right? Business practices, quality improvement, uh, uh, but also research in those regulated ways. But secondarily, hospital systems often, when patients come in to get treated, ask the patient every time to sign what we call TACOs, Terms and Conditions of Service. And that is an additional legal clause that one can ask for more. If one doesn't want to give that right, then one doesn't have to get cared, right? but that's a choice a patient makes in the United States. So it's usually a two-pronged approach. Of course, it's medical data. We have to steward it carefully as per federal law, as we have regulated uses, but we get, gain that right uh, and uh, that permission through the terms and conditions of service that patient signs. So um, again, I answered that entire answer without using the O word, owner. Okay? <laughs> well done. Uh, we got that. We, we got that one. And we have the taco word now. I like that. <laughs> tacos. Yes, we love tacos in California. <laughs> And I think the next voted question uh, brings us back a little bit on, to the technology side. We hear a lot of the opportunity to apply all of this uh, in AI, all the algorithms and the fancy things and information we can do. But what's the real challenges then applying it in the healthcare system, especially when it comes about hospital management? Yeah, maybe I'll go first here. So I think it's additionally challenging because these are new tools. They're uh, often brought in with a lot of hype. Uh, and the evaluation schema isn't really set up yet. Now, the analogy that I've been trying to promote for health systems is exactly similar to how we introduce new drugs or pharmaceuticals, right? So in most health systems, in fact, it's regulated, we need to have this done. We have what's called a pharmacy and therapeutics committee, a PNT committee. And so when a new uh, drug is proposed to be used on formulary in a hospital, the PNT committee reviews the literature, the clinical trials, and then stewards that process for a year to make sure are there any untoward side effects? Are the drugs being used correctly? I think we should use the exact same approach for AI and algorithms, that there should be a committee that actually knows, right? It might not be pharmacists. It might be this 
you know, hypothetical chief AI officer. So I'm there, but at least the tech people in the hospital to evaluate medical professionals to review the literature to see did the clinical trials show an improvement. And then a stewardship process over the subsequent 12 months. How is it working? Um, for example, we changed the test x-ray from this vendor from that. Is the algorithm still working? Like all of that needs to be stewarded constantly the same way we do with drugs and devices. So I think we should borrow that same parallel mechanism to make this happen in health systems. Yeah. Tim, anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I think that um, in simple terms, uh, business case is not a dirty word, right? We, we, we don't want to do AI for the sake of AI, just like we don't want to gather data for just gathering data. You want to put it to use, you want to add value. And if you have a AI solution but you cannot convince the management, you can, can, cannot convince the board that it's usually this part of the puzzle. So uh, I mentioned uh, Heineken before, we also uh, built machine learning solutions for them. I was able to negotiate a deal where we didn't get paid a, a fee or an hourly uh, fee. I got a percentage of the, um, of the cost savings that our tool brought. And there was a heavy discussion because the CFO was against it. He said, we never do this kind of performance-based deals. And what, what if you save me a lot of money? Wait a minute. <laughs> so he was actually arguing against himself because if he saves money, then I would make money. So that is another way that I think AI can have a business case. Uh, that's a great example. And I know there is a lot of topics also on healthcare transformers on uh, the whole value of health system, value-based healthcare, where, mm. you know, the, the, the compensation is actually linked to the benefit right. from a patient perspective, right? Uh, that's a that's, that's great example. Uh, another question that comes up is, um, I mean, talking about the value of data and the value of what we do with the data. Uh, I mean, how can healthcare organizations best show the value that data sharing is giving back to patients and encourage them to allow the consent. Is there any model that you apply um, other than signing specific agreements? It's a great question. In fact, of all the questions in the Q&A, this is the hardest one to answer in my opinion, hmm. because I don't think any of us do this exactly well yet. So we are trying to engage communities to show them the value of the data that we are doing, right? To improve care for them. But at the same time, it's a, it's a difficult narrative because we don't necessarily want to say our care is bad right now without that data, right? So it's a tough narrative to, to communicate back. I think, first of all, giving data back to patients directly, of course, that's a no-brainer. They can see the values. They can see the text notes. Uh, I think there's some immediate benefit there for them individually. Showing communities that they're benefiting gets harder. Now, one way I think we can do this is through clinical trials. So if we can use our data and recognize that uh, a clinical trial with a potentially life-saving drug being tested is in one part of California, but because we have their data that we can match them to that trial in our part of California, then I think we might be able to get more trials, capture better diversity, which we need to do into those trials and potentially get better, uh, at least research therapeutics to patients. So I think there's gonna be stories like that um, but we need to be better at communicating those stories. So I, 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 I'm barely answering your question and it's a good question. Jim, uh, do, you, do you have the silver nugget to that? <laughs> well, the, I saw that the audience had the option to upvote questions. Let me just upvote and Atul's answer because I have nothing to add. That was great. All right, yeah. that's good. There's one thing I even made a note on asking this question specifically when you talked to him about the uh, blockchain and, you know, exchanging data, decentralization and all that. And the next question is about really the mechanism of monitoring the patient consent collection, specifically if you now connect the third parties and regularly co collect the patient data from. And now I have this picture in mind of you talked about this Heineken example with one simple yes, no answer, but assume there are thousands of potential applications. There are millions of patients that actually would provide the data and there are thousands of users like hospital and healthcare systems. How could you manage this uh, overall, uh, technology-wise, but then also from an application uh, perspective? Yeah, that, that is a wonderful question. And I think that you'll see that once the technology works, we won't call it blockchain anymore. It's just part of what we are already using, just like the word cloud. 
it isn't mentioned a lot anymore because people assume that data is stored in the cloud or you work in, in, in a virtual environment. So you'll see that the blockchain technology, while it may sound exotic right now and something from the tech guys or NFTs or, or Bitcoin collectors, that will all go away. It will just be a mainstream technology that anyone can use. And just like you have apps on your phone, you'll see that there are many applications that use the blockchain and that will become just part of your daily life or the way you interact with your insurer or with your hospital. It will be invisible technology. And the moment it works, people will accept it and adoption uh, will go up. Um, are we there yet? No, 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 not yet. We are on top of the hype, um, depending on which cryptocurrencies you are currently investing in. But we are now dealing with uh, DOAs and we're dealing with NFTs. You'll see that will go uh, down for a bit. And then serious companies, uh, new startups perhaps, will build these tools, right? Just like you say, that will help us uh, take back our privacy in a way that we can actually understand and that companies and other organizations can work with. And, and, and Atul, I mean, you talked about so many different applications in, in, in the US hospital system and uh, everything. I mean, you must have something in place that monitors all that or, you know, that, that consent management. I don't know what, what you do there. Is there any very practical approach you, you apply already? Yeah, I mean, there are dozens and dozens of companies already in this space specific for medical e-consenting. So remember consenting, there's giving consent for doing a procedure, so clinical care, but then there's consenting that's really separate for clinical trials to voluntarily participate in clinical trials. And there's solutions already in place for both. So, um, um, you know, most of these are internet-based. Um, I, I don't even remember which one or two that we work with the University of California, but uh, those companies are certainly there. Um, it's not impossible, uh, you know, e, e, e sign many things, DocuSign and all, uh, just think of the same, similar kind of thing for, um, uh, for consent forms. Uh, now, the education aspect, I think, is more important, right? So to deliver the informed part, let's say, of a clinical trial informed consent is more challenging because obviously getting back to ethics, getting back to uh, equity, um, you want to deliver that informed part in many languages. Um, that is often not the problem in Europe, but I think it's often a problem in the United States. Uh, so we, we have to be uh, careful on the informed part, not just getting the signatures. Uh, also, thanks. Uh, I mean, again, we are tons of questions still. Uh, let me let me try to get this other one. It's also a very uh, broad one, uh, but, but difficult to answer. I can tell you. Uh, can you foresee that there will be a single AI model that can be used to analyze the data? I mean, looking at radiology images, genomic data. And that's collected in different institute. And I mean, also considering the, diter, the different data configuration, you have different you know, technologies, different brands, different kind of scanners. Uh, do you can foresee that a single AI model will be the foundation of, of these type of things? Look, I mean, no one's ever gonna say, no, this can't happen. I think there's gonna be many simpler solutions before this complicated one. Um, you know, a single AI model that can interpret all of this, yeah, it could happen someday, 50 years or something, but you know, in 40, 30, 20 years, there'll be much simpler things. So for example, not all of these data elements are captured at the same time on a patient, right? We might know some things now, the physical exam, the note might be generated a week later, the x-ray, let's say uh, two weeks later, a genome might be uh, you know, three months later. So first of all, we don't have all of those data elements contemporaneously. Um, so you, you, waiting for everything is never really the solution anyway in medicine. Um, Different brands of imaging, that part, let's say focus on radiology. Yes, there should be a brand agnostic AI tool. I don't see that being impossible to generate, but it might be specific for cardiac MRI, for abdominal CT, for chest x-rays, right? These are gonna be teams of people building those models first in those individual modalities. Then eventually I think those will all come together to be, a, I suppose, radiologist in a box. But um, uh, I wouldn't start with the way that this question is being answered because there's many simpler things to solve first. Jim? Yeah, yeah, well, sure. Well, on, on, on an abstract level, there is one AI model for this and that's neural networks, right? Or uh, convolutional neural networks. That is the AI model that uh, Atul also described. This is what radiologists will use. This is what, what people who, uh, who build video tools to, uh, to look at cats and dogs. In, in essence, that is the same model. It's just, 
in the application, that is where the domain expertise comes in and then uh, the model gets tweaked, the parameters are set. So uh, when it comes to image recognition, there is one model, uh, but also if you look at uh, Google, for example, they bought DeepMind and the, the, the killer app, no pun intended, of their software was AlphaGo, right? A, a, a game computer model. But it only took, no, it only, it took some time for them to rethink the model and now they have alpha fold. So the same principles, but applied on protein folding. So that is a giant leap. So that I, 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 I agree with Atul that we're not there yet, but in the end, you'll see that there's a convergence of AI models that will basically use the same technologies and it's in the application that we see the true value. Yeah, thanks. And, and I see, I mean, the next question goes in the, I, I mean, congratulations to the audience also to upranking <laughs> and upvoting the questions that are in perfect sequence to each other. Uh, because now the question is about the financial results and benefits of all that, right? So, I mean, how can everybody that or everyone be involved in the benefits uh, that these AI solutions? So, and this particular one is talking about uh, project coordinators, data collectors, data subjects, annotation teams, uh, also the teams responsible for the training and the model. I mean, is there, how, what, what's the value chain and, 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 and um, across the, that whole spectrum? I mean, it's a tough question to answer. I mean, so let's think about biomedical models and they might be done, let's say in uh, an academic situation or they might be done, let's say in a co company, small or large. The company one's a little bit easier, right? So there might be people trained, uh, are training the models, uh, running the computers, uh, hiring the curators. So the, these folks are getting paid for that effort, right? I mean, it's not usually that free uh, in a company uh, creating these models. Um, in an academic setting, uh, there's also salary involved. So that these folks are not, again, necessarily doing for free. Um, so it's kind of, so, but the financial benefits, I think what, they're, what the question is maybe implying that these are sold for a uh, high value uh, and maybe the dollar should flow back. Uh, maybe that happens a little bit more in companies. In academia, we might uh, pass these off to each other, not necessarily that great at selling them yet to each other. So it's, it's not that easy to answer this question when most of these folks are not just paid, but paid extremely well in today's data-driven economy. Uh, it's a struggle for us to hire these kinds of folks mm -hmm. in an academic medical center or, or in any startup here in Silicon Valley. So. Um, I'm not sure what other financial benefit they're thinking here. Yeah, well, uh, I hate to be the guy who answers with blockchain on every question, but <laughs> <laughs> in this case, blockchain, I mean, th there are these uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. They are basically not formal organizations, but these are people who get together for a single purpose or a mission or a project. And then instead of holding meetings uh, or Zoom calls where people have votes, they actually do the voting in a digital decentralized way. So they have tokens and they bring, so they actually operate in a way that is very effective and they can buy stuff because they use crowdfunding or they can uh, 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 break stuff. Uh, that's a bad example, but they can actually build stuff. And you'll see that this model will also be used for, um, large AI projects where indeed the people who, who gather the data will get their share, people who trained, who labeled the data, who shared their data, who programmed, who developed, who sold, they all get paid because they have tokens in this particular project. So as you always refer back to blockchain, uh, there is a question about blockchain and the, what's the risk uh, involved in the blockchain as the technology evolves? I mean, unhackable or tomorrow, who knows? I mean, nothing. Yeah, any, any risk that you would also flag or is it the, the holy grail of everything we do? <laughs> As you said, I love the questions, Sevadio. There's, there's a lot of also to be read between the lines of these questions. Uh, I won't be saying that blockchain is the holy grail, but the, the attributes that you give are true. It, 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 it's un, it hasn't been tempered with the only occurrences where people said the blockchain was hacked was just because one person uh, opened up his wallet and shared his password with other people, right? So the blockchain itself hasn't been hacked uh, yet. Is this going to happen? Well, the new frontier to give another buzzword is of course quantum computing. Uh, quantum computers um, 
are not of the future. There already are quantum computers and they are way better in uh, decrypting um, secure uh, communication than traditional computers. So I think that will be the next frontier also for blockchain. There are also projects already that combine quantum computers with the blockchain, but that's perhaps another seminar, another webinar. Andreas, what do you say? Okay, <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass the other question to you, uh, uh, Atul. Um, uh, let's, let's go with, with one more. Uh, see, we're coming to the uh, close, but I want to have, because I also had, after Atul, you were talking, I have one master theme already made a note on, and there's a question about how the importance of the quality of the data uh, is, and uh, you know, second version certificate, but data integrity, data quality overall, right? Is can you can you give us a little bit how you deal with that in, in your environment? Absolutely, that's usually the first question I get: is that data, <laughs> this electronic health record data, is so messy, right? And so the way I prefer to answer this question is. The practice of medicine is messy. The EHRs capture that mess just accurately, right? And so it's not necessarily a messiness in the EHR data. It's a messy world. Now, to be really fair, I understand that there's a lot of errors that are commonly done, repeated, and we can look for those and fix those. But you have to consider this, that if, let's say, God forbid, one of my doctors is hit by a bus and another doctor needs to take over the care of the patient today, that doctor, she can look in the electronic health record and exactly figure out what's going on with this patient so that legally and legitimately she can pick up the care of that patient from scratch, right? From zero stake here, right? So if it's good enough that a brand new doctor can read and figure out what to do next for the patient, it's up to us to teach the computers to do that too. And I think it's in there. So of course we know that there's some errors in here and there, but human eyes always skip over that stuff and they know how to interpret that. It's just our duty to teach the computers as well. So I think it's the most beautiful data in the, way, in the world. It's not at all messy. It's a messy world, not the data. <laughs> as, as this is the last question, uh, Jim, uh, final, final comment to this one? The world is messy. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's true. Uh, data is dirty. Um, and when most of us try to come up with a brilliant model, right? A AI solution that does magic. But in the end, better data beats better models. So I agree, we have to clean the data. And this is also the data scientist dilemma, right? A true data scientist complains that 90% of the time he or she is busy cleaning data and the other 10% they're complaining that they're only <laughs> cleaning the data. So that's true. There's a lot of work to be done. And um, once it isn't messy anymore, I think it's also less fun, don't you think? It's nice to deal with messy data. Yeah, thanks. So, um, I mean, as we conclude, I just want to make sure the audience also understands what's the follow up, because I, I, obviously there are a lot, are a lot of very good questions. So first of all, we're going to save all of them and then we will screen them and look into them and answer those questions and address those topics also in future articles, interviews and, and publications or even events on the Healthcare Transformers platform. So feel free to subscribe and also check out the articles on a regular basis. Um, and in this, I really want to thank uh, Atul and uh, Jim for this very exciting, very engaging, uh, very open, transparent uh, discussion. It was such a pleasure. I got on my private phone here. I got some messages from people attending who said they could listen for hours. <laughs> same, same here. Uh, but unfortunately, at some point, everything comes to an end. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks also for, to the audience for such amazing good questions and uh, for joining us. Uh, stay tuned. Again, we will continue the series of events on Healthcare Transformers. And with that, uh, I wish you an either nice morning, nice afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. And uh, thanks again, Atul and Jim, for joining. And thanks, everybody. Thank you.